Hey folks, Matt Eason here of Scholar Gladiator and Todd of Todd's Workshop. Oh. Link below, right. So we are looking at crossbows. So I have shown uh, one of Todd's crossbows um, previously, which I shot very ineptly uh, in my back garden because I didn't really know what I was doing with it. One thing before we get into this, um, so I should have been doing something with my thumb to keep that crossbow bar on. Yes, I'll show you that actually. Okay, video, but, uh, we'll deal with that. Yeah, okay, so basically what we're doing is we're looking at two different types of crossbow here. They're both fundamentally crossbows, they're both medieval crossbows, 15th century kind uh, of That sort. one a bit later, but the, okay. the system, the loading system that that uses, the goat's foot lever, is, is definitely current in the 15th, yeah. Yeah, um, and the other one is a windlass crossbow, uh, which is more powerful than this. So this is a lighter bow, that's a heavier bow, two different loading methods. Generally speaking, is it fair to say that the goat's foot is... It, you can only really use it with bows up to a certain poundage. Yes, I mean, I'm not actually sure how high that would go, but certainly uh, I've done 500 pounds. I would have thought you could do wow. more, so five or 600 pounds. Right, um, okay. Whereas this particular bow is 880 or 860, I can't remember exactly. Okay. Um, but similar bows to this went to 1,200 pound or more. Okay, and theoretically, the windlass being a pulley system, there is no upper limit. As heavy as you can make the bow, you could make a windlass to uh, deal with it. Yes, you could. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so this type up to about 500 pounds. So this will have a faster rate of shooting. I don't want to say rate of fire, but you'll be able to reload and shoot this yes. more quickly than the windlass. One. Yes, you will. Um, yeah. Roughly seven, eight seconds a shot you'll get off this, something like that. Really? That's, yeah. wow, that's, yeah, okay. That's, uh, Six, yeah. seven in a minute is not a problem at all. Really, yeah, so it's faster than the musket, basically. Yes, it's as fast um, as the musket. But, but not as long range as the musket. Um, no, well, <laughs> I mean, th this is a very lightweight one. This is about 180 pounds, I think. Okay. Um, you'll get out of this 140, 150 meters. Um, okay. But, you know, if you made a 300 pound version of this, then you'd be getting 200 meters out. Right, okay, so yeah, so it's a similar effective range to a, to a musket actually. Um, and um, I don't know why I'm comparing to muskets, but I am, that's just what came into my head. Um, in terms of, so inevitably, crossbows get compared to longbows an yeah. awful lot, don't they? And you've spoken quite a bit actually on your mm. channel, uh, again, link below, um, about this kind of longbow versus crossbow thing. They're very different. Uh, mechanisms and they convert energy in different ways don't they I mean obviously the the power stroke on a longbow is far longer yeah um, so just explain to us for a second what the power stroke is for anyone who doesn't know so there is a difference between talking about longbows and crossbows um, that you would talk about the draw length of a longbow from the inside of the bow to the point at which the string gets pulled back that would be the draw length you don't really talk about the power stroke of a longbow, it's just not used. But actually the power stroke is, there's the string at rest, that's where it comes back to uh, full draw on this. So that is the power stroke, that is the distance over which it is pushing the bolt. Yeah. And, and the same would be true of a longbow, but it's just convention has become different. And yeah. so you don't actually talk of the power stroke of a longbow, but uh, the power stroke of, a, of my longbow is around about 25, 26 inches yeah. as an uh, to give you an example but it draws 31 inches yeah yeah so um and obviously this is about six inches isn't it uh yeah it's a bit shorter, yeah. so so yeah so we're so we're talking five or six inch of 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 deploying that energy into that missile that's going to shoot at the enemy or shoot at the target compared to 20 odd inches of the longbow so yeah 26 so so just to jump in there, roughly speaking, you have 20% of the time yeah. to put that energy into the into the bolt. Yeah. And so that's really why, you know, like this this thing here, 860 pounds, you know, a lot of people go, my God, that, that'll shoot through walls, that'll stop tanks. <laughs> no, it won't. <laughs> it's like this, the draw length is so short, it doesn't have that time to put the energy into it. So, yeah. you know, um, delivery power, this will be about the same as a 140 pound longbow, let's say. Yeah. Um, so not the tank stopper that perhaps you might think. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's the headline. Like if, if, you've, if you've not yet looked into this topic in, the, in any depth, as Todd says, we're talking about an, an, the heavier bow here, the windless one, around 800 pounds might be roughly equivalent to the power generation of a 140 pound longbow or warbow. Now 140 pound uh, longbow is, is yeah is beyond what I can draw beyond probably what Todd can draw. it's beyond but there are people out there shooting bows of that poundage um, known as warbow archers these days um, but you know warbow longbow same kind of thing 
just going to say, yeah. look up Joe Gibbs. Yes. Um, yes. Joe Gibbs shoots or can shoot 190, 196 pound or something like that. Yeah. And he shoots it like I'm shooting a 40. It's, yeah. He's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a handful of people who are you like sh- shooting these super, super heavy war bows. But um, the, you know, the main point that I wanted to make is that when we're talking about poundages you have to put it in those terms if you're thinking about longbows or any other type of hand uh, drawn bow when you're talking about crossbows it's a much it's a very different type of thing right so um let's have a look at how these two are loaded and shot should we have a look at the the simpler lighter yeah, version so presumably because these are quicker to shoot uh, quicker to load these are what <coughs> most people on uh, the battlefield in let's say the wars of the roses if someone was using a crossbow in uh, the hundred years war or the mm. wars of the roses this is more like what most of them would have been using perhaps a bit heavier than this yes i mean what i will say before all you crossbow geeks come out here this is a later model so this is uh mid 16th century but the way of loading is as matt points out exactly the same um so uh, i will take some out of camera <laughs> So this is a light hunting bow, so this is, is not of the weight that you take with, to war, but the mechanism is the same. So you've got two lugs here, you just set the nut, so that is where it is all locked, and if you pull the trigger, it'll move to that position. So you do that. This is goat's foot lever, it's a very clever device, and what it does is it constantly changes the mechanical advantage. So at the beginning, the bow's not so hard to pull, so actually the lever is not working so hard. The further you pull it back, the, sh- the shorter this becomes and the more powerful as a device it becomes. So really, it's a very easy thing. Um, you can, like we were saying earlier, you can take these levers up to sort of 500 pound or something without a problem. You just pull it back, look, you know, I can hold it on one finger, it's not a problem. Clicks into position now. Nice little hanging hook there. Um, and these are not the big bolts of war. You know, right. This is this is for messing. These are tar- target or hunting yeah. boats. Um, do you want the honours or shall I? Well, so the thing I'm interested in particularly yeah. is for you to show me how to keep that bolt. Can you just oh, demonstrate? Yeah, yeah. If you if you're shooting downwards at someone, then very clearly that bolt will just fall off the bow. Yeah. So how do you keep it there? So so as Matt's saying, I mean this is um, bolts often have a, a whole length sticking out the front of the of the bow. You see that in manuscripts all the time. And what it means is that although the bolt might actually sit there, it doesn't take much movement before it tips off. Yeah. So, you know, again, if you're shooting downhill, you've got exactly that problem. Yeah. It just doesn't work. So they invented spring clips, a little bolt clip that comes over there. That came in around 1500. But before that, people used the one that God gave them, <laughs> which is that. <laughs> Simple as that. So, Put your thumb <laughs> on top of the bolt. Yeah. Wasn't meant to go over the target there. <laughs> and for, for all you safety people behind, there is a river, and then there's another field that belongs to me, so it's okay. <laughs> um, yes. So, so your thumb. Your bolt. So I, you know, I freely admit when I, so Todd lent me one of his uh, crossbows, and I made a video um, about it previously, but if you just search in my videos for crossbow, you'll find it. But um, I came across it because my target was low I was shooting down at the target and as as Todd said the the bolt just kept wanting to fall off um, and I looked at it and I thought there must be some way around this and I did think about putting my thumb over the top but crossbows are a bit intimidating it's, it's, it's <laughs> right? like you've got this string being propelled by in that case for instance 800 pounds yeah. why are you going to want to put your yeah. thumb in front of it so I didn't want to put my thumb anywhere no. near it but I'm quite happy to watch Todd put his thumb over the top all, all that happens is I'm holding the top of the bolt there, which is about level with the top of the string. I'm not pushing down it really hard, I'm just holding it in place. You pull the trigger and that bolt, uh, that string, pushes the bolt and basically the next thing after that is just free space under I mean, I guess the point is it's not that different from drawing a a bowstring back with your fingers and releasing it. It's a similar thing really, isn't it? Nice. Good. Okay. So, should we have a look at the other one loaded and shot? 
You'll notice I don't say fired because there's no fire involved, but I have to also say that I'm not one of those um, pedant archers who gets really angry about this rate of... <laughs> He's one of those <laughs> But you know, the expression rate of fire is so commonly used and so useful. How do you say rate of fire without saying rate well, of fire? Well, rate of shooting makes it sound like you're inventing some humbly <laughs> term and you're being really anal. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually, I use rate of fire, <laughs> yeah, okay. but I do shoot about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. So so the windlass. So the windlass is a pulley system. Right, so I'll hold that up so we can all see. So basically, you've got a fixed steel bow on there, which, like I say, is 860 pounds, I think, this one, to pull back to the nut. So, uh, not even Arnold Schwarzenegger will do that. Um, <laughs> so basically, you need an, uh, a mechanical advantage. I can't remember the exact advantage of these uh, windlass bows, but what you've got is the pulleys give you um, uh, an 8 to 1. Um, so effectively, even, well, I'll give you a demonstration actually, even without the crank handles, just pulling those two cords. Oh wow. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because, you know, I'm getting an eight to one on it. Yeah. And in all honesty, um, my ten year old daughter can load this bow. <laughs> she can't pick it up and shoot it, and I wouldn't let her actually. She can load it. So, and I have to say, is that, uh, the, the craftsmanship on, on this uh, windlass is beautifully made. If you're watching this thinking, I want one, I want one, well, just go to Todd's website and order one. <laughs> but no, that, it is beautifully made. And, you know, this is a high status object. This would have been expensive to make mm. at the time. And so, you know, it's got embellishments that you probably can't see, but it's got a little bit of decoration on the end of the handles. It's got some uh, filing work. Uh, it, yeah, it's a, and it's also got quite a kind of gothic look, hasn't it? It's kind of yeah. gothic architecture. It's it's uh, really lovely um, with you know little bevels in the edges and stuff. It's 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 a beautifully made thing. It's not only made for function. It's made to look the part they as well. They did, and you yeah. see that again and again with metalwork. They could have just yeah. made it. Yeah, they didn't just make it. They did something more. Yeah, I, I like the way that some of these decorative features as well, like these holes, actually would reduce the weight without compromising the strength as well so it's you know it's maybe a, yeah. um, maybe they thought about that i don't know yeah yeah but yeah. yeah but yeah so what happens is well is this way to demonstrate but so the the foot stirrup on that is yeah. purely there to stabilize it presumably yes you'll find this so what you do first of all is you just set the nut because basically the string being dragged up here and hitting the back of the nut yeah that's what sets it right that's what locks the trigger um, so it comes around. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. And it does that. So you've got to put the trigger, uh, the nut, into the right place first. Of okay. All. So it sort of carries it back into exactly. the into the notch. Presumably, there's a notch inside with yes. a. Yeah. Yes, there is. And then I always turn the trigger away. And um, part of that really, uh, well, two things. One is that you don't accidentally knock the trigger. Um, oh right. Yeah. Because uh, that's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. Um, I mean, people again go, oh, you could put safety on it. It's like. Yes, I could. I really could put a safety on, but they didn't. Yeah, so I don't. you could put a telescopic sight on it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. I'm sure there were some lens grinders in Antwerp who could have made one, yeah. but strangely, they didn't. So, um, anyway, so I get that into the right position. The other thing is, it allows me to see where the nut is, because right. that I can hear for the trigger click, that's fine, but actually, you know, this is a serious bit of kit here with the best part of half a tonne of or a third of a tonne of energy stored up in it yeah. right next to my head. I just want things to be right so I can watch the trigger and make sure that I'm not over cranking things and that sort of thing. Stirrup is there because, you know, I've got a rotary movement that's rocking around, yeah. you know, and so the whole thing's moving. I'm not going to let go of these at this point because there's not a ratchet in them. People right. think that there's a ratchet that they'll stop. Cranoquin does that. This does not. Uh, okay. Um, and Cranoquins are with a handle on the top. And a, and a sort of circular bit. Yeah, compound a cog. Box. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, is it my understanding? I, I kind of think of them more as a hunting thing, more than a war thing. But um, I don't. No, they they were. I'm going to say the word never. They were never used in this country for war. Okay. Uh, but on the continent, they were quite a lot. Okay. So okay. Um, they had a lot of mounted crossbow troops. So yeah. not they shot from horseback, but they deploy. And, okay. and so it's just a very handy I mean, they so it's a horseback shoot. thing yes they right, did. well okay. in that context right, they did yeah. shoot from horseback and in yeah. fact there's um, is it Talhofer there's a lovely sketch where you can see the arse of a horse yeah. there's a guy turning around backwards holding a uh, holding the bow yeah, yeah, that yeah. way round yeah. over his shoulder shooting back like uh, the person who's chasing after him yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't think it would work very much but a lot of <laughs> anyway we've loaded it's clicked 
So now, what I've found is actually there's a lot of friction within this system. If I take it off now, which I can, yeah. that's where it tangles and it's a real pain in the butt. Right. So actually, what you do... Unwind it a bit. unwind it at this point and you've got something good to pull against. Okay. So now you're setting it for the next shot. Oh yeah, and, it's, and like you say, it's ready now for the next loading, so... You were going to have to do that at some point, and that was the easiest point and to do it. And that's the easiest yeah. point to yeah. do it, yeah. Um, and that's it. You can see here in this application that you've got an awful lot of bolts sticking out the front. And that's... Can, can I just grab mm. that bolt? Are you able to... Yeah. Well, take another. Take that. There we go. So this is, uh, this is what's commonly regarded as an armour-piercing type head, isn't it? So uh, what do they sometimes call it? A plate cutter, I think. A plate yeah, cutter I head or something. it's a quarrel or a short bodkin. Yeah, so you can see that it's not a bodkin that you might think of as being like a long needle type point. Instead, it's actually got quite an abrupt um, with four cutting... Uh, edges um, so that once you've punched through the plate hopefully that you've done or brigandine or whatever you're hitting once you punch through it you then everything behind that can pass with very little friction because you've now made a hole that's big enough for the rest to pass through the, the other thing that's interesting actually is that were that head round it has to stretch the metal yeah to pass through rather than cutting and that it takes a lot more energy than cutting so that's yeah. why it's got the four cutting faces on it and just very very briefly the uh, veins or, or fletchings uh, are made of wood uh, wood in that context. Um, They're sometimes oh, leather, gonna, I think. Oh, yeah. oh yes, one. yes, go for it. Don't leave it loaded too long. No, well, it doesn't matter to it, but it just makes me slightly uncomfortable. Uh, and they kick some. And they're yeah. quite loud. I don't know if you heard that. Yeah, quite a crack. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot. A lot quieter than gunpowder, but 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 loud compared to a longbow. Yeah. Um, so if you imagine. A few dozen people shooting them at more or less the same time it would be quite a mm. quite a rattle i think the thing is as well because that is um you know your ear is right down on it i'm not i yeah. can't remember the last time i shot a gun if it has that reverb through the stock but anyway it does vibrate quite a lot yeah yeah and um so yeah so so these are made of wood in this case yeah. but they can be made of leather they, they can. Um, hunting, in hunting context, you see feather fletching, just as you would with an arrow. OK. Um, two fletchings, not three, because of the way the, the bow is. You couldn't have yep. three flighted ones. So it's sitting flat. So it's like sitting that. flat. Um, and these are curved so that it spins? They, yes, absolutely. So um, what we'll do is we'll... Um, we should be able to see that on the slow-mo. But uh, basically, if you put that into storage, if you put an arrow in storage... It doesn't take too long, five years, eight years, before the feathers start to degrade. There's yeah. some sort of mite or bug that eats them. Right. And so 50 years later, you'll have sticks there. You won't have arrows. Okay. Um, not even 50, 20. So those, there's, um, you know, you'll see them now in castles, still utterly shootable 500 years later because, right. because of the wooden fletch. And uh, I did some tests. It knocks off like 1% or 2% on distance compared to feathers. So That's very interesting because I'd always assumed that they were wooden because of the the brutality of the no, of the of the bow on the uh, okay so it's purely for storing the ammunition i suspect that i mean right. i don't know that for a fact okay but, but you can shoot a feathered bolt off a crossbow without a problem at all it makes no difference right okay um they are more of a pain in the ass to to make for yeah. sure um and that curve as you say you know it's um i don't know if we can see to camera but the 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 flight here um is curved so it's almost like an airplane wing section of course. yeah I don't know if you'll be able to see there, but it does that. So what's going to happen is as it goes through the air, it's going to go, which way is it going to go? Uh, that that way? Clockwise, it should Yes, yeah, <laughs> that way. There we go. Um, which, of course, will stabilise stabilize its Absolutely, flight. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want with any arrow or bolt. Or, or bullets, bullet. yeah. <laughs> Just a right, rifling a bullet, yeah. So, spin, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, and I think you, I think by rifling you get a tiny bit of extra range out as well, don't you? I think there's a. Um, in, in honesty, there'll be a million people out there who know the answer to that. Yeah. But if you are spinning it, you're using some of the energy to spin it, and yeah. this will be creating yes. drag because. Right. Yeah. Because as it is spinning, it's pushing the air outwards as well as moving forward. So you will be scrubbing some distance off. Yeah. But it, it's, but equally, if the if the projectile is more stable. That yes. will be increasing its range. Yeah. So it, I'm guessing it's one of those ones where it, you take away, you give. But yeah. primarily, it's probably an accuracy thing, yeah, isn't it? Accuracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, well, that's great. Um, there's the basic comparison between the goat's foot lever. Goat's foot lever, yeah. goat's foot lever and the windlass. 
The main difference being goat's foot lever, much quicker to load, um, but the windlass, much more powerful. Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, I think you would have seen goat's foot levers and belt hooks for battlefield use. Yes. And these more for siege use? Um, well, it depends on your nation, actually, because, okay. um, I mean, this, uh, this particular in windlass style uh, is actually known in crossbow land as the English windlass. Oh, right. Um, so you get another kind of format which is used and known as a German windlass, but this is the English windlass. So we used it enough that we've got a device named after it. So okay. don't think that England is longbow and longbow. No, 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 absolutely. Um, we didn't tend to use it on the battlefield. That's the difference. We mm. tended to use it in siege work. Yeah. Um, whereas on the continent, uh, they were much more prevalent. And, yeah. uh, you know, there'll be, again, 50 million arguments about why my take on it would be that our social structure and the way our our laws were and just the way we evolved as a nation allowed us to use the longbow and to deploy it very well and it is yeah. of course a devastating weapon deployed correctly and the same advantages weren't there on the continent right um for how they use their, their laws and they just never developed in that way yeah. i mean it's an earlier period but i know for a fact um from uh, studying stuff to do with edward the first castles in uh, northern wales that crossbows were on the inventories for yeah. the costs of the castle so uh, when they were building the castles there were costs of the obviously the masonry and the gates and the and oh, then right. the, the garrisons were often very small only mm. only 30 to 50 people and they list crossbows in those garrisons so mm. i think sometimes they were used for defense of fortifications yes. Yes. um and defense and for sure. And of course, in a, from a tower or from any kind of small opening, mm. you can operate a crossbow more conveniently than you can a longbow, because mm. um, you can weasel up a small tower around a you know, spiral staircase and shoot a crossbow out of a, some kind of hole that you can't really do with a longbow a lot of the time. I so. think also you're not, because of your complete lack of movement when you've, when you've loaded and you approach the, the loophole, yeah. your complete lack of movement doesn't announce any intentions you know so it yeah. is that sort of bolt from the blue type thing that <laughs> yeah. you, we're sitting here having a chat and the yeah. next thing we know we've we've got a crossbow bolt flying at, you know at us yeah whereas it had been a longbow guy who popped up over the battlement somebody would have gone hey watch out <laughs> you know, the yeah so, i think accuracy is a big thing as well of course because yeah. because you can be much more accurate with a crossbow you, you can you yeah. can um i mean but there's one thing that, uh, it's another myth that i'd love to people stop because this will this will happen in the comments yeah and, and that is people go oh well you know um the genoese that you could train people oh sorry uh you could train somebody in a day with a crossbow that's the difference and it takes a lifetime with a longbow yes and no yeah um i mean the thing the thing is yes you can pull some teach somebody to to load it and to pull the trigger can they do that under fire can they do that while their mate is screaming with a gut wound can, can they, they load quickly whilst and, being yeah. charged down with cavalry all of these things and the other side of it is you know, if you look at the Genoese crossbowmen, incredibly well paid, yeah. really high status, employed yeah. all over Europe. Well, if it's that bloody easy, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. You know? So there is something that we're missing about it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, and perhaps, you know, perhaps accuracy played a part in that. Yeah. Perhaps some of them were. I mean, we know that they had crossbow competitions where they were shooting at the Poppin J yeah. on the top of Poland. So I think um, the ability to for a skilled person to be extremely accurate with a crossbow uh, was probably you know that was that was a quality of crossbows that longbows could could perhaps not guarantee that degree of accuracy yeah, but again i know there are people who might contest that because we have to say also a medieval crossbow you don't have the sighting advantages that you do with a modern crossbow which has got rifle type sights or, or telescopic sights on it curiously no you don't you don't have that but you do have some and that is, if we just pop that under there. So now, we've got the bolted position. You've got, poking out above there, you've got the bolt head. And the, that's a fixed distance. It's there. the foresight. It's yeah. the foresight. And the rear sight, often you'll see notches in the top of a bow. Ah. And that's where you can position, and maybe that's why they had such long triggers, but you can position your thumb in different points. So the knuckle of your thumb can end up being the rear sight. Wow. So, can, so Okay, that would make a lot of, of sense. Out yeah. sort of 100 yards, you've got, beyond that, you're not, you've got to lob it too much. But right. out to about 100 yards or so, 100 metres, you have got, effectively, sight ranges. 
That's fascinating stuff. Well, on that bombshell, I think we should end there. But thank you so much, Todd. That was a hell of a lot of uh, information and wisdom. I mean, you're uh, of everyone I know, you're the most experienced with these with these um, weapons, whatever machines, whatever you want to call them. And and um, yeah, it's great to get some of your insights into well, that. Thank so you, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, folks. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. You're there. Done. Okay, so probably that. lower than you think. Yeah, Ooh. don't press down too hard. That's it. Yep, a little bit lower. Can you feel me? Yeah, sorry. A little bit lower. Oh, yeah, it does go higher than you expect, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they always lift. Interesting. Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.